Alright, now one thing that I was immediately surprised about when I said I was going to do a Orthodox Fuseki lecture was that someone apparently did not know what the Orthodox Fuseki was. So really quickly, who can tell us what the Orthodox Fuseki is? And yes, Sullivan C., you are quite right. It was played a lot last year. This year, it is all about the Low Chinese. Yes, one enclosure plus four four. Now let's go ahead and... Oh, just lay out any old thing here, I guess. There we go. We have a nice enclosure in one corner. Four four in the other. This is typically regarded as the Orthodox Fuseki. Uh, the Orthodox Fuseki. Now, can you enclose high as opposed to low? Yes, you can, but I'm probably not going to get into that today. Yes, there is audio. And telling you that there is audio when you cannot hear me is not very well read out. Uh, R10 and R14, most common, I think. Uh, what? Oh! One step ahead of me, I think, there, Dango. Before we get to how white should approach to uh, dealing with the orthodox Fuseki, we should need to know uh, exactly what black is trying to do here. What is the purpose of this particular Fuseki? And I will type something to Ochi for a moment. Might want to reopen KGS and or make sure speakers are on and KGS audio is enabled. All right, immediately we have an answer again from Dango. Speed, territory, and influence. Bit of a vague response, but all right. Typically, I play the Orthodox Fuseki when really I can't make up my mind on what else I want to play. I mean, it's a nice, uh, flexible opening. In one corner, you've got territory, as we can see here. Nice little enclosure. In the, in the opposing corner, we've got uh, a stone that can be used either for territory or influence, so it has uh, options available to it, and we'll be seeing that shortly. However, as I mentioned earlier, we have to figure out what it is that we actually want to do here. Uh, as you can see, by in the lower right hand corner, it looks like we're after some territory. So one next really good move for black would be what? Someone just said 017. Interesting. Someone else said K4. We're getting into a lot of interesting uh, suggestions here. Um, but yes, the answer that I was looking for was either of these, Q10 or R10. Black would dearly love, and let's go ahead and place this real quick, to either get an extension from the enclosure which also works nicely with his 4-4 stone. Either high or low. Low being a little bit more territory oriented. Now, that said, we can jump back to what Dango was uh, mentioning way back in the comments as to what white typically does in response to uh, the Fuseki. Because after you realize what your opponent wants, then you kind of have an idea on where you should be playing. You don't want your opponent to typically get the large moves that he would like to get for himself. So we start looking at moves 
uh, most commonly probably seen at uh, A. Go ahead and just split this. Simply look at the board and take uh, our opponent's large move for himself. That is one perfectly fine way of playing. I also will be going over the other move that he mentioned, B. This one is also very, very common. One that is not common, however, and I'll go over this briefly right now, is O17. Now, since you all were just informed what black would ideally like to take from this Fuseki, then it shouldn't be that difficult to go ahead and find... Um, Yes, not common. It shouldn't be very difficult to go ahead and find where we should probably think about playing for black. Though, a lot of people will study this Fuseki, they'll know A, they might even know B, and when they see a little bit more unusual moves like this, then they kind of lose it and don't really know how to follow up. But now that we know what we want from this Fuseki, it's very easy. For example, we know that we would like to go ahead and take an enclosure for ourselves. So, by that rationale, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to go ahead and pincer, for example. Because that's in the opposite direction than what we're interested in. Instead, it would make more sense to go ahead and play either the uh, one space or the small knight. That way, if, let's say, I don't know, white simply takes a uh, Chiseki here, we can go ahead and get that large point that we were interested in, that extension. Now, since this gives black exactly what he was looking for, this isn't very common. Because typically we're not in the business of giving our opponents exactly what they want. Unless maybe you're in a teaching game. Or just experimenting or whatever. Then sure, you might give your opponent exactly what he wants. But since we typically don't want to do that, let's go ahead and look at A instead. A clearly aims to just go ahead and split the top from the bottom. Now, quickly looking at this, we can see that White has options to go ahead and get extensions, either above or below. So, what do you think we should do in terms of responding to this little stone? I mean, it can obviously live in whatever direction it extends. You can play elsewhere. Um, playing elsewhere, though, is a little bit more commonly seen if, let's say, uh, let's go ahead and rearrange the board here real quick. Oops, that wouldn't, that's the handicap. There we are. That's a bit more commonly seen if, um, white's got a 3-4 uh, stone to approach. Because approaching 3-4 stones are worth a fair amount, making sure that your opponent can't get an enclosure for themselves. 4-4, four, four, not really that much trouble. Even if an enclosure is made, there's still 3-3 three, three availability. I was also getting that to element C, yes. As I was about to say, the one part, uh, part where that... Uh, Yeah, where that's actually changed is when you're looking to develop in a very specific way, which I'll get to in a moment. For now, I'm going to go over the uh, older variations that probably everyone knows. Which is that... I didn't hear a click. I'm on edit. Okay. There we go. The older variation everyone knows is probably R8. And some people I still encounter will tell you that this is, in fact, the only variation, which is kind of odd. But I assure you there are others, and we'll be going over them. But yes, uh, pushing from your enclosure, we'll go ahead and throw white over to your 4-4 four, four stone. Typically, a 3-space extension is most commonly seen. 
though we can also see two space as well, just as common. Uh, from here, it's again not wanting to let your opponent get exactly what they want. If you go back and choose to play passively here, and white gets a very, very strong uh, base that really doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, Aji lingering with, then this result is typically regarded as too good for white. So instead, when we see that three space, we'll usually go ahead and chuck a stone in there. This way, white has to figure out exactly how he's going to settle still. You know, while he's doing that, you can go ahead and profit. From here, we'll probably go ahead and jump up as white. And the reason why we're going to do that is because black has two stones that he must worry about. So he's got to make the decision, how is he going to defend himself? If he chooses to defend the pincering stone, for example, then good for white gets to completely enclose a corner. Needless to say, that is too good for white, especially since... the stone that black was attacking isn't even quite dead yet. So it gets to enclose, still has options of dragging out the stone later. Not a good variation for white. Instead, typically we'll go ahead and enclose. Defend our corner, make sure we're not going to get surrounded. And now white has another... Er, sorry make sure black doesn't get completely surrounded. And now white has a another choice on the hand. Can I explain N17? Um... You mean, uh, right now? As in black playing here? Is that what you're referring to, Emerus? Or instead of R12. Ah. Um, yeah, I'll probably come back and touch upon that, sure, I suppose. Hmm. Alright, more commonly seen is the small knight. It forces white to go ahead and make a decision. Are you going to go ahead and aim for my corner? If you are need to be careful not to go ahead and defend the 3-3, except in very, very rare circumstances, because once again, white gets a very nice base, black has all but lost uh, R12. It still has Aji, but it's not going to be going anywhere. So once again, this is regarded as too good for white. Instead, we'll drag that stone out of there, give up our corner, but we still have plenty of room to extend. So this is regarded as an equal position. Black gets to go ahead and be fine up top. White gets the corner. And depending on what white wants to do, white can also go ahead and bring this stone back to life. I'm going to disagree with that, Exavad. I think this is uh, an equal position for both sides. As long as you're aware of that Aji is remaining. If you view R10 as dead, and you do not know how to live with it, if you can't see, for example, that, um, defend, I guess, that we can quite easily jump out of here, and, whoops, not that, and uh, get some easy shape for ourselves, then, yes, I would agree that black would have the better position here if our ten was regarded as dead. But it's not. It still has Aji, it can still come out. If it comes out, then we can start eyeing other things, potentially, like maybe A or possibly even the corner. Though, typically, it's better to uh, not do that immediately. It's usually uh, better to do that later on. Because even if you don't get a chance to play it, 
having your opponent, uh, let's go ahead and give black move again, having your opponent waste a move to go back and deal with the lingering Aji on the right side of the board is still pretty good, because that means you just get Sente to play something large elsewhere. Either are fine. I've seen games where that stone was brought out immediately, I've seen games where it was brought out later, I've seen games where it wasn't brought out at all. It really depends on what you want to do and how you want to continue the game. Okay, I cannot make Heather Tales of the SGF tree, so let's just go back to something else. Um, right, so we did that. Now... If you don't like that variation, you can theoretically go back and, as white here, try and kill off... <clears throat> Excuse me. You can go back and try to kill off R12. Black will be happy to take the corner, which also goes ahead and activates the connection underneath. But let's say you do this and black does something funny. Let's say black peeps. And can someone who is not Dango Mango, because I know he knows this, uh, tell us how White should respond? Are we in serious trouble here? Looks like White's gonna get pushed through. Black's escaping. How do we respond? Oh, Ochi says let it go. Potter says let it go. All right, we got a lot of people saying just go ahead and let it go. But if you do go ahead and... Wait, P13? Yeah, so we have a lot of people saying go ahead and uh, let it go. If you do decide to play something like uh, P13, then I'm afraid that you have actually been tricked. Allowing black to break through here is... Much too good for black. Because believe it or not, you can respond here with a simple connection. And black can't escape. Black will try and escape. He'll uh, push, or maybe he'll even do this, but that doesn't make any sense because we can all read that we can just push here and no matter how we connect, he's going to get cut. But if he pushes this way, he still can't escape. Because if you Hane, then you can cut. And if he bends, making himself really, really tricky and trying to attack your two stones, then we can very, very loosely net these stones and ensure they can't go anywhere. Because this can't be pushed past. It, there's a lot of Hane and... Even an Atari, but there's nowhere to go. We have massive liberty shortages. Black stones are simply dead. Yep, probably happens to everyone at least once. Um, if you don't block... Uh, and do what instead? If you do this? Well, that's a block too. I don't know what you're referring to. Oh, this? Okay. Then I guess you're looking at something like this? Well, you tell me. Now what are you going to do? How is white going to get out of here? Does white have a chance here? Doesn't look like we're really going anywhere. I mean, the only thing that uh, black, white can really do is descend down, and that doesn't do much. Because we can't try to entire our way out of here, right? 
Because here we're just going to go ahead and escape. And now white's in two different groups. That's... That's deadly. So all we can really do here is give up our stones. But, moving on. Um, let's see, I mentioned this as well. That instead of the three space and the complication there, sometimes uh, black will find white simply making a two space extension. In which case, most commonly, black's going to go ahead and put a lot of pressure on these two stones to make sure they're still unsettled. And if you play in this way, I can almost guarantee you, every last time, especially if you're a... Uh, Q player, you're going to see your opponent approach the top, thinking to maybe give you a very, very small area here and uh, have white be hmm, relatively satisfied. Uh, question, will I be explaining why R12 is inferior to R8? Uh, as soon as I figure out what you're referring to... Oh, um, R12 is not in theory, and I'll be going over that in a minute, too. I'll be going over those variations as well, don't worry. But if you find yourself playing uh, in this particular fashion, one quick and really, really easy way of uh, answering is simple attachment, because now we're slowly putting our opponent behind enemy lines. since we can kind of draw a loose little line between these two stones. You're allowed to ask questions. Do not troll people who are commenting, please. Because now, for example, we can go ahead and try to keep white low. If we keep white low, we'll be getting a lot of influence for ourselves and try to keep the name calling to a minimum. One thing that I really like about Tygem over uh, KGS is the ability to uh, right-click and ban individual people from your lecture. Really do wish we had that. But let's see, I think that covers it for R8. No, it doesn't. I think that covers it for R8, unless I'm forgetting something. If I'm forgetting something, I'll come back to it. If B, if B backs off here... Oh, uh, yeah, I did. Well, not with a two-space. If black backs off here then white gets to go ahead and make a really, really large base. And that's nice. So, I think that about covers the variations for what happens when uh, black plays R8. However, since the uh, this variation is pretty standard. I mean, if you play R8, your opponent almost nine times out of time will make a three space extension. You're going to throw in, and because we know that this is a little bit inferior, unless you really, really, really want influence, uh, than simply uh, going in the corner and making this exchange, you're probably going to see this variation played almost every time you play at R8. So you might want other options, which is why we're going to get into moves like uh, R13 and R12. Now, there are two ideas here. You could play relatively uh, passively and simply take a large knight for yourself, forcing your opponent to get a two-space extension. And for a while, a lot of people would tell me that this was flat-out bad because you don't want to push your opponent to your enclosure. But you're able to take an enclosure on the top right as well as get Sente to extend from it. Now, you can also take this a little bit further if you're a bit of an aggressive player and don't mind getting yourself into uh, 
potentially complicated um, situations. For example, you could have that variation in mind and choose to approach your opponent's 4-4 stone instead. Because now, uh, depending on what they do, they could, let's say, back off, for example. We could go back and see the exact variation. And now, we are able to gain not only the enclosure with the extension, but a little bit of a framework going here with uh, F17 as well. So gain a lot on top from uh, pushing around that uh, our 10 stone. Nowadays, if you go ahead and as white here, go ahead and split the orthodox fuseki in this fashion, I can almost guarantee you that this is probably the most common variation that you're going to see. Your opponent either playing R12 or R13 to try to develop a large framework over here. Nowadays, the R8 isn't played quite so often because it's been essentially played to death and we know exactly what we're going to get. Um, question from Romulus. If white R17 now, and I really wish I knew when he said... Oh, here? Ah. Uh, if white R17s... Alright, um, you tell me. Which way would you want to go ahead and defend this? We have voting for Q17. Exactly. We look at which side's bigger. And if we have a wall here, looks like it's being used with Q13, or sorry, not Q, R13, that's kind of small. And if we envision a wall here, we can see that it's being used with K16. So we definitely want to block on that particular side. So we definitely block there. White's going to extend, and now you have a bunch of different options. One option you have is simply go ahead and play something like this, I guess. Uh, let's not deal with Algy, let's just say you connect. One option, you simply take your wall to use with K16. And that's fine. I suppose in this variation you could also theoretically go ahead and play R18 as well. To put a lot of uh, harassment onto white, make sure it's very, very difficult for him to go ahead and settle. If, for example, he decides to maximize his eye space, which is fairly possible here. Then you might get a little bit more out of the deal. Of course, in this very particular variation, you are also giving up uh, this potential cut to uh, your opponent. And that's a bit of a problem. But you are getting more influence. And since that uh, new created, newly created Stone of White only has two liberties, you can also potentially continue trying to uh, uh, develop here out into the middle. Or maybe even save the stone, I guess. So there's Aji there. What about R14 as black? I uh, don't know what you're meaning. Where do you mean R14 as black, Exavad? In response to R16... Uh, do, do, do. Hmm. Now, I think they just gave white sentai. So I imagine white's gonna go ahead and... play this? Though, you just left a... Uh, hmm. 
Hmm. There's a lot of Aji here now. I guess it was going back into this one. I probably wouldn't play this way because the shape is extremely weird. If I wanted uh, Sente, I'd probably just go ahead and play here instead. And pretty much regardless of whatever uh, White's next move is, I'd be ignoring it. Um, let's see here. Do I have to go back all the way? Um, it might work at the time, but the question is how much Aji are you leaving behind? Uh, question by one short. Is Q18 a better invasion than the 3-3? Three, three? We do see the Q18, or no, we don't. Um, we sometimes see the Q17 variation. Q18, on the other hand, is giving away a lot while you're keeping yourself low. If you're going to do that, you might as well just go ahead and play Q17. That way you're getting a bit more of a solid, mm, solid uh, base out of the deal. But either way, you're going to be under attack now. Um, they're just different options. Here, you don't want to be enclosed. You want to maintain access out into the center. Things like that. With this particular group. The other way, you don't care. You're just going to go ahead and hit the framework uh, at its base and live. Just for some quick reduction. Now, you saw that this variation was common. And you saw that the other variation was common. So the question then becomes... Well, actually... Now there's one more thing that I want to go into, because it's actually kind of common. It's a similar idea, but it involves uh, R12 as opposed to... the uh, Large Knight. And the reason why sometimes people will go ahead and play here is because if your opponent plays anywhere else but the top side, then you can continue and pressure your opponent to getting a um, whoops, a uh, larger area for yourself. And sometimes you actually see that directly, as opposed to this. You will see your opponent go ahead and pressure you, and then keep pressuring you. in order to get that top sign. Now, as white, you might not like that last variation. Maybe you don't really like dealing with uh, that particular large, scary framework on the top of the board. You can also go ahead and... and you obviously don't want to, you know, play here and give white... or give black, sorry, exactly what he wants. You can also go ahead and approach it B like I mentioned. This is probably the most common approach. We typically see this over the split nowadays. And unfortunately, there are so many different ways to respond to this. We can go ahead and play the uh, small knight. We can pincer. We can pincer wide. We can pincer tight and high. We can pincer farther away. We can do almost anything. It really is a question of what you want to do. I mean, you might say that 
A is a mistake, because we were not interested in A. We were interested in the right-hand side, but you can still be interested in the right-hand side. For example, if your opponent tries to go ahead and get... Uh, if your opponent tries to go ahead and take the corner away from you, you can still build up a uh, large framework here with a simple choice of Jiseki. If your opponent uh, tries to get some of the corner and you don't like influence, you like territory, you can attach and get yourself some territory. Things to obviously consider if you find yourself playing as uh, white and black here. If you go into the corner, you might get pincered, you might get attached to. Um, I could probably spend an entire lecture going over this attachment and the different Viseki that are here. I don't think I'm going to do that, though. Suffice it to say, if you're, if you're black here and your opponent decides to Hane above, you can play a variation like this where you're getting territory. If your opponent does something really, really bizarre and play underneath, you have the option of going after influence. You also have the option of throwing in. Though, I will warn you, this can get kind of complicated, because now you're dealing with ladders. If your opponent takes, then you could simply say, fine, I'm going to do this, and, you know, get your uh, influence again. If your opponent says, I'm no, I'm going to Atari, then you can take your territory, and that could be okay. Or you can play this, in which case we are now dealing with ladders, and you have to be very, very careful as to where that ladder ver or that ladder goes at all times. I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Those are the two obvious uh, variations. So suffice it to say, there's a lot of different variations, even if you decide to go ahead and back off. You can still potentially get influence if your opponent wants to go into your corner, you can still get more territory if your opponent wants to go into your corner. As white, you might want to keep that in mind, and if you don't like any of those, you might want to go ahead and just back off here. Make certain that uh, you don't give those options to your opponent. And if this sounds complicated, it's because uh, it kind of is. It just kind of, you have to know what you want out of uh, what you're playing for, really. If you don't mind giving your opponent potential uh, more territory or influence, if you don't mind those variations, then sure, you can go ahead and just settle yourself. If not, then you probably want to go ahead and back off. Same as white. Maybe you don't like that because you back off, your opponent will back off, and maybe you think that... Um, Again, you're playing the whole wrong side idea, that you should have pincered so you can take advantage of your enclosure. Well, that's fine. You've got a whole heap of pincers here to choose from. You could pincer low. And one variation you probably will not see is your opponent jumping out. Why is that? Why don't we usually see this? Can anyone tell me? Why don't we usually see this variation? What's wrong with it? What makes it unusual? R12 does have friends, that's true. It is very tough to deal with, though I'm not certain if it's tough to deal with for the reasons that you're thinking of. It's tough to deal with because black is getting a lot of territory and we have no idea what white's getting. We know that white, if white doesn't protect this, black's going to cut through. We know that if white does protect this, we've just given Sente back to black after giving him a lot more territory. So what are we possibly going to deal with? What, what, can't speak. 
what are we possibly going to do with this wall? Typically, we see this Triseki played more in Handicap Go than anything else, because you might want some influence to deal with all those extra stones on the board. But when playing evenly, this can get very, very difficult, because you don't really want to leave this as is because there's so many weaknesses. And that and the whole fact that this can still be pushed through, because we don't want to block here, on account that we don't like dying. So typically we are not going to see white jump out. So what can we do if we don't jump out? What do we have for options? Um, let's see, we've got O17, okay, R16, did not expect that one, but okay. I noticed that, no, wait, alright, Dango has said R17, but what do you guys think of R17? Good move? Bad move? Balanced move? What do you think? Alright, Emil happily says bad. I don't know why anyone would say it's bad, but... Some people do find it uncomfortable because it kind of feels like we're going back into giving our opponent exactly what he wants. It's like, oh, hey, he wanted to go ahead and develop the right-hand side, and we've changed directions and given him exactly what he wants. Influence. However, the only, uh, one of the reasons why this is still playable is because if your opponent continues to try to expand off of it, you have a bunch of different options available to you. I'm not going to go with A because... Unless you're being tutored by Isidol, I don't really recommend uh, A all that much. It's a lot easier to look into books and find out how to deal with shoulder hits by playing here. By playing it B as opposed to A. So, I mean, B is very simple to uh, deal with. We can go ahead and uh, just respond really quickly and get shape for ourselves. So, black has to consider that as well. And, of course, if black takes that away from us and decides to go ahead and get the enclosure, take away the shoulder hit, then we have Sente. We can make a, a framework for ourselves, I guess. We can approach and make sure that uh, black doesn't get a double wing. I mean, either are, you know, fine options. So this seems like a reasonable uh, opening for both sides still. Uh, some people said that you can change directions, that's true. I'm sure many people have seen that before, if we change directions and chances are... Well, a couple of things might happen. Your opponent might go ahead and let you connect up, and that'll be, you know, fine for you. you got the corner and got out. Blocking... No, Q13... Um... Probably if you don't want that stone getting away, or if you don't want that stone getting out, you probably ought to play it. Sometimes I don't. Um, 
Q17, I kind of want to go over in later variations. They're a little bit different, but they're kind of similar, so we'll come back to that, I suppose. That goes off in a different pincer. You can also go ahead and approach high. We also see that occasionally. Similar idea. We can go ahead and uh, live in the corner as white here. Black gets influence. Oh, and I should also mention, I also went ahead and played L17 out of habit here. After a black extends. It's usually uh, a fairly reasonable idea to do so. Because if we play elsewhere, then we're leaving Aji behind. A lot of Aji behind. We're kind of flat. We're giving influence away. Don't really like that quite so much. Instead, to, instead, uh, when I play this Jiseki, I typically go ahead and extend from it because I know my opponent should respond. If my opponent does not respond, I can go ahead and play the attachments to follow up, which is not a nice move to play against White. White should have protected against this because if White plays this way, then White was just enclosed. And if white plays this way, then we can't be killed. Now the corner's almost dead. A19 is the best corner approach. Everyone knows that. But, like I said, there are a lot of other options here available to you. C, I have to say, is probably one of the most complicated. If you're not careful, you can get into some really ugly variations with C. And the reason is simple. If you approach tightly, if you, not approach, if you pincer tightly, then you're leaving a little bit less Aji for your opponent. The farther you pincer, the more Aji exists for your opponent. There's more wiggle room. They haven't added uh, R11 to Kogos yet? Hmm. Alright, guess I'll go over this a little bit then. I see, very few variations. Well, I'm only going to go over a very few variations, so maybe they've added these variations to Kogos. I don't know. Suffice it to say, once again, we are not jumping up. Doesn't make sense. It makes even less sense now than it did before, because we have absolutely no idea where we're going now. I mean, leaning over here is way too far away. We're going to get pushed and cut and slaughtered and resigning very, very soon. Uh, we can cap, I guess, but still no idea what we're doing with this yet. Just making shape, I guess not really getting much out of the deal. So jumping out doesn't seem like a good idea. Yeah, usually this is an emergency measure. If, um... I don't know. Uh, let's go ahead and throw some more stones on the board, just randomly here. Maybe if... Black already had a bunch of different points here. And we were just looking to live somewhere. Then staying out, not going into the corner, and just getting a living shape here might be good enough based on whatever Black has. But at this point we're playing Handicap Go, so we've kind of completely changed things. Well, it would have to be handicap style for black to have that many stones. But, so instead of going ahead and jumping out for obviously no purpose, we typically change directions. Can we still go into the 3-3? Three, three? Yeah, we can do that. Can we change directions? Yeah, we can do that. We can also change directions and approach very, very far away. 
all of these are perfectly perfectly uh, viable uh, options to you. Eh. Well, the level this lecture's at, I'm gonna go ahead and say that A is fine too. A is reasonable. It's a lot more reasonable than jumping out at P14. Can you show why BR10 is a bad pincer here? Um, I didn't say it's a bad pincer. I haven't gone over it yet. I might not. Uh, suffice it to say, you're putting even more, even less uh, pressure on your opponent. So when your opponent uh, changes the direction, which is likely going to happen, and you'll see that in the next couple of variations, then you're going to have to spend a lot more moves to make sure that this doesn't uh, get uh, it doesn't go anywhere, essentially. Suffice it to say, most uh, common variation here I'm probably going to go ahead and say is probably the uh, high approach. Your opponent's likely to split you. Which is where we see uh, what was asked about earlier. Blocking instead of allowing white to connect. And here is pretty simple. We go ahead and simply connect here as white. Black gets to choose, well we can rather, there's a couple of different options. Black will um, typically go ahead and push. And now there's a very, very, very important uh, move to remember here if you do play this variation. And that move is Q13. Do not play it. If you find yourself playing this, your opponent's going to be very, very thrilled and make sure that you can't use your wall. And now we're kind of left wondering why on earth did we play this way? That doesn't make any sense. Our stones are useless now. Instead, we go ahead and leave it, because if our opponent does want to go ahead and do something here... Oh, really? Okay, um, what do you do if your opponent does Atari, then, uh, Exavad? Did you go over that? What if I play here as white now? Mm-hmm. Good. And now we're left wondering why did we do that? We're giving our opponent a lot larger of a wall, aren't we? That didn't make any sense. So yeah, that's why we're not really worried about leaving that one stone behind. And this way, we actually get to use some of the wall. Which we wouldn't do if we actually went ahead and connected. Because your opponent is definitely going to deny you the ability to use that. So that's one option. There are others. White could say, for example, that he is going to go ahead and... Uh, Hane. Make things deliciously complicated. Now, I could probably, again, spend an entire lecture going over different variations here. I mean, there are a lot of complicated ones, so I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. Um, what is the most simplest, what is the simplest variation here? Uh, da 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 da, doot, doot, doot. I think that's kind of simple. I think the extension's kind of simple. No, the extension's probably kind of, uh, oh well. Could go similar fashion. But in here, black ends in gote. White gets to take the extension. The only uh, thing to be aware of, though, is since black has a little bit of uh, more influence here, extending along the bottom is also viable. Uh, 
Ah, uh, I see. But yeah, there are a lot of variations here. I mean, there are variations involving white going ahead and... or black going ahead and playing the connection instead, because that kind of throws people off. It's like, now what do we do? There are variations that involve um, black playing the Hane. Same thing. Now what do we do? And like I said, some of these get very complicated, which is why I uh, don't really want to spend a lot of detail. Oops. Don't want to spend a lot of time going over them. Because we can go over the... Uh, this position, for example, for about an hour in and of itself. Suffice it to say, there are ways to get, uh, yeah. Probably saw it multiple times in professional games too. It was common for a very uh, long time. Along with uh, this one. But that should give you some idea. Well, I guess for fun I'll go ahead and do D. D looks weird. This two-space extension probably looks very, very strange to you. And here we just go ahead and keep the group separated. Oops, sorry, my bad. Not that variation. I don't want to do that one. Here we go ahead and just keep the group separated while everyone settles. Yeah, this is a nice variation for both sides that we've been seeing a lot, as opposed to uh, some of the other longer, more complicated variations that just kind of wreck the entire board. Yeah, yeah, the other ones... the, the other ones... we don't like the other one. I, I'm not going over this one. Really, I'm not. Yeah, it's really, really easy to mess this variation up. This is not something that should be played by anyone but high dons, really. So I'm not gonna go over that one too much. But to say, if you do invite this upon yourself by playing the two space high know that your opponent might have other things in store for you much easier to go ahead and just reapproach uh, one space away and play a variation that's a little bit more common you've never seen it before good it's horribly complex it's one of those things that kind of approaches the taisha level But then again, there's a lot of uh, horribly complex variations like that. Even in something simple. Even in something as simple as this, for example. There are horribly uh, complex uh, variations. That we typically never want to see. This, of course, being one of them. Because now there's how many different groups that we've got to worry about now, and how many different ladders, and liberty shortages, and blah, 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 blah. Typically, both people will avoid this. And just connect here. Because the other one, it's so easy for both people to make a mistake. And if you make a mistake there, congratulations, the entire game is over. Pros are typically very good at finding variations like those. And then once they find them, they usually avoid them and go back to something a bit simpler. Because it's really silly kind of deciding an entire game based on the outcome of one Jiseki. 
granted, a lot of Blitz players do love those variations. They kind of seek them out. Playing 10 second go, your opponent will make a mistake. But you expected that when you began playing 10 second go, so can't really complain. Uh, T11 instead of S9? Uh, uh, oh, why here? Because you're dead. This can't live. Yeah, isn't there a nice reason for that? But yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, I played it earlier today. Actually. Well, yesterday, really. Uh, is there anything else that I want to go ahead and go over? We went over A and B. I guess we kind of went over C. The most common variations, anyway. I think you all know what you're aiming for if you play the uh, Orthodox Fuseki. Um, I wish I could show you right now what my SGF tree looks like, which is why I'm not rifling through it to look for variations. It's just one giant mess. But I think that's about... No, Tengen does not enter into this. Thank you. I saw that in my last game I recorded on... Taigem. I don't want to see it again. That, that was enough. As white, your response to the Orthodox is to play Tengen. I will let you experiment with that, and then you can come and give us a lecture on your results. But I think that about covers uh, this particular lecture. I might have to add more at a later date if I remember something I left out from the first one, for example. So, if there are no questions, There are questions. Um, no idea what you mean by D10. What if B play... What if B Tanuki to a corner approach? Um, that's... That's possible, yeah. If you approach and your opponent splits, then you can just double approach. And now you're back in normal Jiseki again. Black's probably going to play either A, B, or C. Though A and B are pretty much the same thing. And if A, then just go in the corner. Uh, what was the variation where when pincered R5 becomes an option? What? When pincered R5 becomes an option. I don't think R5 is an option when pincered. I think you're thinking of S4, or in a completely different variation. Or wait, that's not even pincered. Oh, the Lee Sedol option. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, a few games, Lee Sedol actually opened up by dealing with the Orthodox Fuseki by playing the attachment to uh, the enclosure, which, I mean, it fits reasonably. I mean, the enclosure is pretty 
strong, so you're attaching to a strong group to make yourself stronger. You're not attaching to weak stones. So... It's viable. And if your opponent responds and you get to go ahead and play something here, then congratulations, you got your extension. Or you can play even uh, more aggressively, which was the case. Um, after jumping to R17 and living there? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what you uh, meant there, prolepsis, I'm sorry. M12 hurts Exavod's head. Okay. Play M12 to Tengen. Yeah, I'm not going to go over that either. But, alright. Uh, I think that's about it for this particular lecture. Thank you all for coming.